Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this special briefing, Climate Adaptation and Resilience, The Road to COP26, Raising Global Ambition to Address Climate Impacts. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. We'll be joined in a moment by leaders and big thinkers in climate adaptation and resilience. But because so many of you watching today are new to EESI, let me say a few words first about what we do. ESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. We go about our work in several ways, including by hosting briefings like this. We also publish a bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. And whether for policymakers or the public, we do our best to provide informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in written materials and on social media. The best way to keep track of our work and access our resources is to visit us online at www.eesi.org and sign up for Climate Change Solutions and follow us on Twitter at EESI Online. Our discussion today, excuse me, um, Sorry, I, my, I'm, I'm reading this so that I wouldn't mess up and it just disappeared. Um, together are with our co-sponsors, the 2021 UN Climate Change Conference, the British Embassy Washington, and the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Our panelists will help describe the current state of global adaptation and resilience planning, financing, and disaster preparedness. On behalf of EESI, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the leadership of the British government, and experts and practitioners of ASAP and its membership for their efforts to promote adaptation and resilience to date, connect stakeholders and share best practices, country to country, state to state, and city to city, and, there's, and the assistance and support to make possible our briefing today. Often when we talk about these topics, it's accompanied by a sense of the challenge before us. But I feel like today's briefing is coming at a time that's also defined by a sense of opportunity. This is the week of the 51st commemoration of Earth Day. The Biden-Harris administration is about to host the Leader Summit on Climate and will unveil the new greenhouse gas reduction goal, the United States nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. We expect the summit to focus on how the US and other major emitting countries can redouble efforts in an equitable way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors of the global economy. Along with the other official actions taken by the US government and other nations this week, there will be a host of events, panels, discussions, commitments, and commentaries that collectively will contribute to the momentum leading to the next meeting of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP26. The goal of this briefing, our modest contribution to the conversation leading up to the summit, and eventually to COP26, is to highlight the complementary global efforts to advance climate adaptation and resilience. Adaptation and resilience feature prominently in EESI's policymaker education. About two years ago, we initiated a 16-part congressional briefing series about coastal resilience issues that featured success stories and innovative approaches from US coastal communities from Hawaii to Maine and from Alaska to Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. We recently released a comprehensive report based on the findings of the briefing series that featured 30 specific policy recommendations for Congress to consider. Together with our co-sponsors, oh, excuse me, our report, A Resilient Future for Resilient Communities, A Resilient Future for Coastal Communities, I'm having a terrible time today. This is my first briefing of the week, so apologies for that, is built around six guiding principles that generally inform our approach to climate adaptation and resilience policymaker education. The sixth principle listed climate adaptation and resilience work should complement and contribute to a decarbonized clean energy economy is what motivates us today. Our report leverages the work of state and local adaptation programs, which would benefit greatly from more financial resources and more and better data, coordination, and technical assistance. There have been some significant steps in the right direction by the federal government, including the authorization of the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program managed by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And more and more is being done including the work carried out under the January 27th executive order uh, on uh, tackling the climate crisis. 
but in the U.S., federal climate adaptation and resilience efforts lag behind plans and proposals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I wanted to share this perspective, especially for policymakers and their staff in our online audience today. Congress, in particular, must understand that any progress we realize at the international level to advance adaptation and resilience will support federal efforts here at home. And that means states and local governments will be better equipped and prepared to manage and respond to threats. And communities, especially those on the front lines of climate change and the most vulnerable due to past and present environmental injustices, can be safer, more secure, and better able to withstand and recover from increasingly frequent and severe climate impacts. We will hear in a moment from representatives of the United Kingdom and the United States governments about the significant work underway to advance climate adaptation and resilience, including by coordinating and strengthening international cooperation. And then, joined by two leading adaptation and resilience experts, we will look ahead to COP26 and beyond and define the scope and scale of our challenges, as well as a pathway to success that will deliver planning, preparedness, equity benefits here in the United States and abroad. Before I introduce our first panelist, let me just make a note about how you can engage with us today via the live stream. Of course, we're not all together, but there's still an opportunity for you to ask questions, and you can do that in two ways. The first way is to follow us on Twitter, at EESI Online. The second way is to send us an email, and the email address to use is EESI at EESI.org. We will take uh, the questions that come in from our online audience and incorporate them into our Q&A discussion at the end. And now it is my privilege to introduce our first panelist. Andrew Jackson joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 1990. He has a wide range of, has held a wide range of positions in the FCO and across the government. He was Deputy Ambassador in Argentina, Counselor for the Knowledge Economy in India, and held other overseas roles in Algeria, Italy, and Norway. Other recent positions include Head of Science, Innovation, and the Climate Department, and uh, Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor in the FCO, Deputy Director in the Cabinet Office, Joint Anti-Corruption Unit, and Deputy Director, Gulf Projects, Department of, for International Trade. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I'm really looking forward to your presentation and um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Andrew, I think your video is, there you are. Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation this morning. And, uh, and congratulations to the Environment and Energy Studies Institute, uh, EESI, on the initiative for, for this event at the, at the beginning of what is a very important week for our collective efforts on climate change um, and in the run up to COP26. Um, I think we'll all be wishing every success for, the, for this week's um, Leaders Summit. Um, pleased that you've chosen the theme of uh, adaptation and resilience. It's a key pillar in the UK's uh, approach to hosting COP26 in Glasgow. Um, and in this short presentation this morning, what I'd like to set out is some of the ways that we're um, trying to facilitate engagement on adaptation and resilience um, as a campaign um, in the run-up to COP26. Putting that into context in line with the the Paris Agreement, um, we are prioritizing the three pillars of raising ambition on mitigation as we try and keep temp temperature increases um, to the 1.5 degrees target, um, raising ambition on adaptation, um, which I'll go into in more detail, and raising ambition on finance for both mitigation and adaptation. That includes the uh, $100 billion commitment, um, but also ways of mobilizing more private investment. And as well as all of this, it's a high ambition for collaboration. Um, between countries, um, international organisations, business, civil society, all the things that we need um, in order to build, uh, build success. Um, I'll be focusing this morning um, on three main areas, the ways that we improve planning to achieve adaptation and resilience, practical actions in particular sectors, um, and finance for adaptation and resilience. Um, but briefly, uh, just to recall the context, um, I think we, we all know that the impacts of climate change are being felt now and that our response cannot wait, um, from flooding to forest fires, desertification, already a direct impact on, on millions of lives. And even if we stopped emissions today, the world would still need to deal with significant climate disruption. And, and then, sadly, of course, as the impacts are felt right across the world, it's often the most vulnerable communities that are hit the hardest. 
Um, indeed, um, uh, climate related disasters are estimated to cost the global economy some $520 billion uh, and, and could push 26 million people into to poverty. So as we think about adaptation and resilience, um, I think we, we already have an increasingly good basis to understand the, the challenges. Um, the 2019 Climate Action Summit included a call to action on ad adaptation. Um, at the beginning of this year, 2021, um, the Climate Adaptation Summit hosted in the Netherlands um, set out an adaptation action agenda. Um, the UK and a number of other countries launched an adaptation action coalition um, that I'll speak about uh, in a moment. Um, and most recently, at the end of March, the UK hosted a climate and develop, development ministerial meeting um, focused um, on the, the countries most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. There's also then um, a growing awareness of the opportunity from uh, investment in, in successful adaptation and resilience, um, with the net benefits from investment um, far outweighing the costs. Um, for example, it's been, it's been calculated that strengthening early warning systems as part of disaster risk responses has a cost-benefit ratio of nine to one. Or well, the Global Commission on Adaptation um, um, assessed that investing 1.8 trillion in climate adaptation over a decade in areas like disaster preparedness, water, agriculture, could result in benefits as much as 7.1 trillion. So what we're trying to achieve um, in the, the UK's, uh, as the incoming COP presidency, um, is to ensure that adaptation resilience is right up there on a level with mitigation and the other actions that we're promoting. So how, we, how are we approaching this? There, we're working with a lot of different organisations um, uh, globally that are, that are contributing to this agenda. Um, and I think it's fair to say that even beyond the direct work we're doing, there's fantastic work being done more widely in these areas. Um, and these are the things that we're trying to galvanise and bring together. Um, but at the start, one very important area is the things that we can do to improve adaptation planning. Um, this can be the national adaptation plans or national adaptation communications in, under the UNFCCC. And these are critical ways for countries really to integrate and mainstream climate risk uh, in their planning. So we want to work with countries um, to help bring forward um, ambitious plans and communications um, and where these already exist. Um, to work together on ways to implement them. And in this, um, it's a model where, where we're encouraging inclusive approaches. Um, so it's the national level of planning and the subnational level of planning, um, finding ways to get down to the, the most effective locally led adaptation. Um, the UK and others are supporting principles put together by the International Institute for Environment and Development, the principles for locally led adaptation to show how transformations can be achieved. Um, and in doing it in this inclusive way, also taking, taking into account the position of women, girls, young people, indigenous populations, those who are often directly affected by the impacts um, uh, of climate change and also often with um, uh, knowledge and experience that can really help us to catalyze effective change. In this space as well, um, promoting the um, uh, leadership of uh, least developed countries, including, for example, the Least Developed Countries Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, known as LIFE AR, um, which is consistent with the LDC's 2050 vision um, and aims to set out a long term for vision for planning and delivering a climate resilient future. So this is one part of the planning piece. The second part is very specifically um, improving the focus on disaster preparedness and, and responses. Um, and this is an area where we know um, from looking at the impact of uh, natural disasters in recent years, where there, there has been progress in areas like Bangladesh, um, significantly reducing deaths from the, the cyclones affecting that country, um, where we can really learn and really make a difference. So one part of our work here is working with the platform of the, the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership, or REAP, um, um, which has set a goal to make a billion people safer from climate risk and disasters by 2025 through expanded early action on financing, improved urban warning systems, and better capacity um, to act on risks once they're identified. And that also means bringing together um, members of the development, humanitarian, climate and environment community, private and public and local community actors, these kind of inclusive platforms um, to improve uh, disaster risk um, planning and responses. The UK has already contributed to the work of, uh, of REAP and, and we're encouraging um, other countries to do so, um, building on this good practice. 
Um, in, in this space as well, um, organisations such as uh, Insu Alliance, a public-private partnership supporting developing country businesses, helping improve climate risk assessments that inform decisions um, uh, in terms of preparedness as well. So this is the second part of planning, very specifically to ensure that we can deliver improvements um, in disaster risk responses. The next part of the approach is around practical actions. And I mentioned the, um, the Adaptation Action Coalition um, created earlier this year, um, initially launched by the UK in partnership with Egypt, Bangladesh, Malawi, the Netherlands and St Lucia, um, and now a number of other countries uh, joining, which we're very keen to encourage. And this is a state level uh, initiative um, to focus on um, building a high level amb of ambition and understanding of practical real world actions and implementation um, to deliver adaptation resilience. Um, and in order to do that, some of the initial work that we'll be doing um, in the coming period includes a focus on water, climate resilient health systems and climate resilient infrastructure that have been prioritised by the countries involved. Um, so why water, for example, is this one of the most in demand sectors for, uh, for developing countries in national climate planning, coping with the pressures of floods, droughts, increasing water scarcity. Um, and the sort of tools that, uh, that have been considered are, um, a water tracker, for example, um, that helps, helps mainstream risk management in the water areas across relevant government ministries, be they environment, finance, um, uh, economic, specialised water ministries, getting this really joined up approach um, to ensure the right investments um, are, are put in place and de-risked. Um, why health, the impacts on global health, everything from uh, air quality to um, food and water insecurity, increasing infectious diseases, um, health impacts of extreme weather events, um, risks of reduced access to public health services. Um, again, a very significant area that we want to explore in more detail. Um, and particularly at the moment, as we, we struggle with the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for resilience has been made clearer than ever, this is one where we bring together the climate and health uh, experts. Um, infrastructure, the, the third of the initial ones, um, um, significant annual damage already costs, already caused to road and rail transport by extreme weather events, um, some of the highest costs in, in middle income countries, um, but also indirect costs. Um, uh, um, can be even larger than direct energy. So we're looking um, at ways that we improve in resilience and in infrastructure investments as well. This work um, is, is kicking off next, next month um, uh, as part of the Petersburg Climate Dialogues and will continue in run up to, uh, to COP26. As, um, as we think about these different uh, areas um, of the planning and of the sector based initiatives, um, we're also promoting the new Adaptation Research Alliance. Um, uh, launched in January this year that brings together research funders um, and funders of, uh, of, of practical programmes um, to coordinate future research, um, identifying knowledge gaps and priorities by sector um, and supporting innovative examples of best practice that we can, we can scale up. So the picture um, from this part of the, the practical actions is that we are understanding more where there is the role for um, investment technology and innovation that can create opportunities um, for practical actions and the complement to the um, uh, adaptation action coalition is um, the race to resilience um, that has been put to that has been launched um, as a global campaign um, it actually sits along the the race to zero uh, um, put together by the un high level climate champions that's also then aiming to bring together initiatives from non-state actors to build the resilience of 4 billion people um, in communities vulnerable to climate risks by 2030. And this is already collecting a wide range of proposals and initiatives from private companies, other um, non-state institutions um, to drive forward uh, opportunities here. Um, I mentioned as well um, the, the importance of agriculture um, here. The UK's um, campaign model um, for COP26 also includes a specific nature campaign. Um, and here, the, the cross cutting nature of adaptation and resilience, we're seeking to support the, the just rural tran 
position initiative that was launched at the Climate Action Summit in 2019, um, again promoting improvements in policy action, innovation um, and investment, um, building more on the transition to sustainable uh, agriculture. So this gives a, a range of uh, an, an illustration of the range of the ways that um, we are prioritizing and, and understanding sectors where adaptation and resilience can make a can, can be achieved. Um, the third pillar of, of the work um, is finance, and um, here the goal to help increase total amounts of finance, but also make sure that it is more um, accessible and um, efficiently deployed. So working with, Devon, with donors, multilateral development banks, investors, um, to encourage these uh, flows of climate finance. Like I said at the start, this includes on a commitment to raise um, uh, $100 billion uh, a, a year for international climate finance. Um, the UK has already doubled our national contribution on climate finance um, to £11.6 billion pounds over the coming years, and we're encouraging others to, to follow suit. Um, but also um, working with development finance institutions, um, working with them to, to create a new collaborative to accelerate investment in adaptation and resilience, and working with private sector initiatives such as the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, um, which is already helping um, with the modelling of, uh, of risk in investments that can help shift more private investments for example, into resilient infrastructure, supporting vulnerable communities uh, to, to attract more investment. Um, so the, the finance uh, work, um, very key to the, the whole approach here, but as I say, we're keen to complement that with the practical solutions and the planning tools. And I mentioned that um, in amongst the recent initiatives, the, the UK hosted a climate and development ministerial meeting, um, bringing together a range of countries um, and multilateral institutions focused on hearing directly from the countries most vulnerable to, to climate change. Um, and this, out of this meeting, um, a range of ideas and initiatives um, being taken forward that, that includes um, seeking new on access to adaptation finance um, that the UK working with Fiji and other countries um, will aim to deliver and then also a, a recognition that there's some climate impacts that, um, that no amount of uh, adaptation will suffice to deliver and this is the, uh, the issue of loss and damage which, um, which can be challenging one in the negotiating context um, and the, the UK will be organising a series of consultations to um, operationalise the, the Santiago network on loss and damage, um, which was uh, which was set out at the COP25 meeting, and again looking at what are the practical solutions um, in these areas that we can put together. Um, another point coming out of that climate and development ministerial was um, uh, consultations also around the global goal on adaptation. Um, again, uh, making the link into the the border preparation of the the COP meeting. So the pictures I've tried to illustrate here, and it's a lot of organisations um, and a lot of partners, a complex one. Um, and I think it reflects that adaptation and resilience is different in every country. There's, there's no single solution um, uh, for effective adaptation and resilience. The finance is an essential component, um, but very important that we're raising awareness of uh, what can be achieved in specific sectors, the importance of planning so that climate risk is fully integrated, um, the particular opportunities um, in disaster risk response and management um, and the new kind of models that we can promote that accelerate private investment, um, improving opportunities for the application of new technology um, and innovation. So this is just a brief overview of the work in hand, but um, I hope it illustrates uh, the, the level of importance attached to achieving progress around adaptation and resilience. Um, been a pleasure to, to run through this introduction to this work um, and really looking forward to uh, hearing from the other presenters and I, I know a lot of work being done uh, here in the in the US um, and uh, to um, hearing questions on this as well so thank you very much. Thank you um, so much Andrew for an excellent overview of um, all of the work um, that's going on around this on this topic. Thank you very much uh, for that um, great way to kick off the panel. Um, 
We are going to introduce, I'm going to introduce our second speaker, second panelist in just a moment, but before I do, um, Andrew just mentioned looking forward to the Q&A, so am I. If you have questions, uh, you can ask them in two different ways. The first is by following us on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email, EESI at EESI.org, and we'll do our best to incorporate them into our discussion. Our second panelist is Leonardo Martinez Diaz. He is currently senior advisor to special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry. Previously, Leo served as global director of the Sustainable Finance Center at the World Resources Institute. And I think in that capacity, Leo, that you um, were a panelist at an ESI briefing, I think in late 2019, that was uh, delay and pay or plan and prosper, one of the best briefings we did. Um, um, that year. So thank you very much for that. He is author, with, along with Alice Hill, who we'll be hearing from in a moment, um, of Building a Resilient Tomorrow, How to Prepare for the Coming Climate Disruption. Leo, it is wonderful to see you this morning. Thanks again for being an EESI briefing panelist, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Dan. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of uh, this event again. Uh, as you mentioned, the last presentation we did with EESI was, uh, I think, really, really uh, satisfying and, and helpful, I hope. So it's great to, uh, to be back in this forum. Uh, I want to talk to you today about the administration's efforts on resilience and adaptation. And, and just as an introduction, I want to say that having served with Alice uh, seven of the eight years uh, in the Obama administration, uh, it is clear that for this administration, uh, resilience plays a, an elevated, uh, more prominent place, a more prominent role than it ever has uh, in, in the US. And I think that's a, a function of a couple of things. One is obviously the urgency of the moment. It's now clear that the impacts of climate change, once thought to be in the distant future, are now squarely in the present and uh, that degree of understanding of the impacts is, is now, I think, uh, permeating society and has uh, penetrated quite deeply, including in the policy world. So uh, adaptation now has a degree of, is, is accorded a degree of importance that I've never seen before in, in government. But also uh, adaptation and resilience, I think fits really well with a couple of the uh, President Biden's priorities for his government as a whole. One of those is equity. Uh, and the importance of environmental justice, of climate justice. Uh, it is very clear that uh, the impacts of climate change do not affect everybody equally. It is clear that uh, not everybody has uh, equal capacity to adapt and to recover from climate impacts. And so if we're going to address issues of structural inequality, uh, of, uh, of racial disparities, uh, we're going to have to deal with this, the very uneven way in which climate impacts affect uh, people. Uh, and therefore, there's, a, I think, a natural uh, union between the issue of, of climate adaptation uh, and advancing uh, environmental and climate justice. The second uh, priority for the president is, of course, jobs, the stimulation of the economy uh, and the recovery uh, after COVID. And here again, uh, although often the conversation is about jobs in the green space, sort of renewable energy jobs and uh, uh, energy efficiency, employment, and so on. Uh, I think oftentimes we underestimate how important uh, resilience-related employment is going to be for this recovery, not just in the United States, but, but abroad. Uh, the fact is there's many different technologies, uh, uh, services, and know-how that are going to become essential uh, to the new economy, the, uh, the post-COVID economy, uh, and just as important as the solar panel installers and the wind turbine uh, maintenance uh, workers, you're going to need uh, an army of uh, resilience uh, advisors and resilience workers who are going to be integrating uh, climate into infrastructure, into services, into urban planning, uh, into, into health uh, policy, and so on. And so I, uh, I think there's also a natural dialogue there between the president's focus on jobs, uh, uh, good paying jobs, union jobs, and resilience. And so in some, there is now a, a special importance accorded to, to this topic. The first example of that is the summit coming up on Thursday uh, and Friday. Uh, this is the, of course, the leaders summit on climate. It's the administration's first major uh, international event on uh, climate change. 
Uh, in the old days, this would have been an extension of what we used to call the major economies forum. That is uh, a group of 17 or so uh, largest economies and largest emitters. And the conversation would have been dominated as it was in that forum in years past uh, on, uh, on mitigation. It would have been focused very much on reducing emissions uh, and uh, on the NDC elements that were all about um, uh, controlling the uh, emissions of carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. And so this time around, it's going to be different. From the beginning, it was clear that this wasn't just going to be about emissions. Uh, it wasn't just going to be about the largest 17 or 20 economies. Uh, it was also going to be about uh, the impacts, about resilience and adaptation. And so as a result, you'll see that the lineup for the summit, which now includes 40 heads of state, uh, is not just about the big and the uh, economically uh, weighty, but also uh, about countries that are on the front lines of climate impacts that are highly vulnerable uh, to climate change. And so that will be, uh, adaptation and resilience will be very much a part of the summit across all the sessions. Uh, it will be woven into uh, the conversation throughout, whether it's on finance or uh, jobs or innovation uh, or indeed ambition. Um, and in addition, there will be a ministerial level uh, session as part of the summit, which will focus exclusively on resilience and adaptation. Uh, there will also be a ministerial session on climate change and security, which uh, also touches, I think, on many of the issues that folks here care about. So the summit will, I think, be the first example of how uh, we are now at a, in, a, in a different age where mitigation and adaptation uh, are now seen as really uh, co-equal parts uh, of the solution. Let me also turn to the larger policy frame that the president has put in place. Uh, it involves really an all of government effort to advance uh, climate uh, solutions. Uh, and so as you saw from the executive order uh, issued uh, back in January 27, uh, adaptation and resilience are uh, very much part of all of the homework that the agencies and the federal government have been uh, assigned by the White House. Uh, let me just give you a few examples. Uh, on the domestic side, uh, a national climate task force has been created, headed by Gina McCarthy. And uh, uh, part of its mission, part of the task force's uh, work uh, is to very much focus on adaptation across many different domains. Uh, the executive order also calls uh, on the Department of Commerce uh, to provide a report on ways to expand and improve climate forecast capabilities uh, and, and information products for the public. So you'll see, uh, I think, a lot of work there um, channeling NOAA and other of the science agencies' capabilities. The Department of Interior has been tasked with uh, providing a report on the development of a federal geographic mapping service that can um, facilitate public access to climate-related information. So a lot of the issues that we could sense were going to become very important back in the Obama administration are now uh, really being rolled out and structured uh, as whole of government uh, efforts. The um, infrastructure bill that uh, the, the jobs uh, bill that uh, was sent to Congress is being discussed with Congress uh, is also a reflection of how important resilience and adaptation have become. Uh, there's many parts in the bill that uh, incorporate uh, adaptation and resilience into infrastructure, uh, including, for example, in uh, the upgrade of our electrical grids. Uh, of course, most folks still remember um, the impacts of uh, extreme weather on the Texas uh, energy grid. And uh, like that, there's many other examples. California, of course, uh, with the wildfires, where there's um, serious gaps in the resilience of our infrastructure including some of our vital uh, systems uh, for power, water, and transportation. And, uh, and this bill, I think, uh, shows you that new generation of thinking in which climate is very much um, baked in, not just in terms of reducing the emissions of this infrastructure, but also in terms of how that infrastructure is resilient to the impacts of, uh, of climate. And finally, at the domestic front, um, there's uh, going to be, as the media has reported, uh, a focus on climate-related financial risk. Uh, there's now, I think, uh, a very wide appreciation that um, climate change, both the physical impacts of climate change, 
as well as the transition to a zero net zero economy itself present challenges to companies, the company's business models, the company's bottom lines, uh, and to financial institutions that may be heavily invested in either assets that are vulnerable to climate impacts or in assets that are carbon heavy and therefore could become so-called stranded assets uh, in the future, in the future once we uh, move, the economy moves away from uh, high carbon solutions. Uh, and so there's a real need to look at those risks uh, and to manage them uh, effectively, to measure them because they are often not measured at all in the system uh, and to figure out how do we uh, ensure that the transition is, um, is smooth, uh, that financial institutions are able to uh, continue to function effectively, even in the presence of these risks. Uh, and so I think you'll see more action coming on that front. Um, let me turn to the international side uh, briefly. Uh, we are, I think, very focused on adaptation here at home. And, uh, and that's uh, certainly uh, a big change from, from the past. But also in the international space, there's, uh, I think, renewed vigor and renewed energy, uh, as um, uh, Andrew has just mentioned. And I think, um, let, me, let me talk about a couple of, of elements here. One is, uh, as well, in finance. Uh, I think you're going to see increasing interest in uh, growing uh, the, the quantity of finance that is being devoted to uh, adaptation and resilience but also the quality of that finance, namely how do we spend it, not just how much we spend, uh, to what extent is it reaching uh, beneficiaries, to what extent uh, is it really building long-term capacity of governments uh, and businesses and communities to manage what's ultimately a highly localized uh, set of risks. You know, to what extent are we making data, information and research available, not just to those who can pay for the state-of-the-art modeling, uh, but for communities around the world that uh, are unable to afford uh, the most uh, expensive bespoke uh, products that will be put out in, in the uh, advanced economies. Uh, these are, I think, at the heart of adaptation. It's no longer just about financing individual projects here and there uh, and the proverbial sort of seawall or elevated road. It's about how do we get communities to better understand the risks that they face uh, and to better make their own choices uh, that allow them to become more resilient uh, and more uh, adaptive uh, to climate. And that is, I think, uh, requires a slightly different set of tools. Um, we'll be working, uh, we'll be uh, releasing very shortly as per the executive order, the so-called climate finance plan. Uh, this will be a first, the first document of its kind in the US government. Uh, it will uh, lay out a strategic vision for how uh, the government approaches international climate finance. Uh, and it will uh, identify a number of concrete steps that different agencies that work internationally will be taking to ensure that they are working together better and that we are making our climate finance uh, more effective. Those include, those agencies include, of course, uh, USAID, the State Department, the Treasury Department in its role uh, overseeing the multilateral development banks uh, and uh, also uh, the Development Finance Corporation uh, which works closely with uh, the private sector uh, around the world. I think for all of us, uh, for all of these agencies, um, we're still learning. Uh, it's still a learning process, uh, trying to measure impact in the adaptation space, uh, trying to quantify um, some of that, uh, of that progress. Uh, and we need to get beyond metrics, uh, such as number of people made resilient, right, which can become sometimes um, too simplistic, but rather how do we measure more effectively the degree to which we have actually reduced the risk or the degree to which we have actually increased the capacity uh, of a community to manage that risk? Uh, and that is, I think, the next generation of, uh, of thinking about how do we measure progress uh, in this space. Uh, the G7 uh, coming up this summer is going to be a crucial moment. Uh, as you know, the UK presidency has, uh, thank you to, to all of you from the UK government who have been part of this, uh, have put a very strong emphasis on adaptation and resilience uh, in the G7. Uh, I think it's the right uh, decision, and I think it's going to help catalyze action uh, in both quality and quantity uh, of climate finance. Um, and finally, I think it's worth talking about standards for how we do things, uh, including infrastructure. Uh, I think um, 
it's interesting to see across the system a number of different standards are emerging or initiatives are emerging for how do we incorporate climate into infrastructure. So you have, for example, uh, India, the India-led uh, climate uh, disaster uh, resilient infrastructure uh, initiative. You have the Climate Coalition for um, a resilient infrastructure. You have the Blue Dot Network. You have the G20 principles for high quality infrastructure. A whole series of different approaches to try with all of them with the same goal, which is uh, to ensure that when we build uh, major pieces of infrastructure uh, that are going to be around for uh, decades, that they are uh, systematically designed and adapted and constructed to uh, withstand um, uh, future impacts of climate change. Even if we don't understand precisely how uh, the climate is going to evolve, uh, there are certain features that can be put into infrastructure as uh, Alice and I speak about in, in the book uh, that you mentioned, Dan, um, that can be put in place now, and which can then allow you to adapt uh, as the situation evolves uh, through time. And that's something we see now internationally uh, as part of all of these initiatives, um, which is really uh, quite important. Uh, finally, let me uh, uh, close by, by stressing the importance of investing not just in the ex post finance, that is to say, uh, the money that is there to help people and communities rebuild and recover uh, after the impacts of extreme weather, uh, but also to invest heavily in the ex ante, uh, that is to help communities and businesses prepare for those impacts before they actually happen. I think, in, as I've argued with some colleagues in my previous, uh, uh, previous life, uh, there is perhaps too much emphasis right now on the ex post there's a lot of money going to clean up uh, and not enough going to preparedness. Uh, and that is, I think, a um, uh, disequilibrium that we need to address, especially given that, as, uh, uh, as we just mentioned, uh, the investments in ex ante preparedness are often much, much more cost effective than cleaning up after. And so uh, that is, uh, I think, an, an important principle we'll, we'll continue to follow. Um, let me just close by saying that um, uh, mitigation and adaptation are no longer in competition with each other. It's clear that they need to be uh, at the table together. And in fact, uh, we need to find ways to ensure that solutions work uh, on both at the same time. Uh, and that is, I think, uh, also part of the next generation of thinking. Let me hand it over to you, then. Thank you, Leo, um, for that um, wonderful presentation and overview. Um, obviously, an extremely busy time in Washington and around the world on these issues um, and um, means a lot uh, to EESI to have you and our other panelists join us during such a busy time to um, bring all this information to our audience. So thank you so much. Um, our third speaker um, is Alice Hill. Uh, Alice is the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations, where her work focuses on the risks, consequences, and responses associated with climate change. Alice previously served as special assistant to President Obama and senior director for resilience policy on the National Security Council staff, where she led the developments of national policy to build resilience to catastrophic risks, including climate change and biological threats. Her new book, The Fight for Climate After COVID-19, will be published in August 2021. And of course, I've already mentioned the book she's working on with Leo. Alice, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I will turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much for having me. Re really a pleasure to be able to join you here today. And I wanna thank uh, Dan for your leadership and the British Embassy for th their leadership. It's wonderful to hear from you, Andrew and Leo, uh, my partner in book writing and certainly my partner in fighting for resilience in the Obama administration. And clearly he is continuing to lead that fight in the Biden administration. So really a delight to be here with you this morning. And since this is a congressional briefing, I think I'll frame my remarks in terms of what Congress can be thinking of with regard to this challenge of adaptation. It's been hinted at in the remarks that adaptation has been like the poor cousin of mitigation, the, or the cousin that's 
sent to the kids table during Thanksgiving or mitigation negotiations, climate negotiations. And as been, has been said, that clearly needs to change. You, in the midst of a pandemic last year, 2020 was tied for the hottest year ever. And if you look at the impacts across the globe, uh, there's no question that climate change has definitively arrived. We had zombie fires in the Arctic. We have saw temperatures reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the Arctic. In the aptly named Death Valley, we saw temperatures, the, probably the highest temperature ever recorded, 130 degrees. We got a new word, gigafire because so many acres burned in the West, we had to term a fire that burned more than a million acres. And of course we had those 30 known, named storms along our Atlantic coast, which forced us to turn, meteorologists to turn to the Greek alphabet. And as we're having this session right now, there is a super cyclone headed towards the Philippines, the earliest uh, in the season ever recorded with wind speeds of over 190 degree miles per hour. And of course, last year, the Philippines was hit by a cyclone with a wind speed of 195 miles per hour, the highest ever recorded. So we can't wait anymore. We're already seeing very heavy damages across the globe. Munich Re, the large reinsurer, has estimated that it was 210 billion last year of that 95 billion was in the US. So to the extent we think we are exceptional, we will not be exceptional in terms of avoiding losses from climate change. So as we head towards the COP, uh, one essential element that the COP and the Paris Agreement already recognized is that the best way to start adjusting to a different future is to plan. And one of the reasons why planning is so essential is because the risk that climate change brings is so unfamiliar. We have built all of our systems, transportation, communication, health, housing, based on an assumption that the past will resemble the future. And that the past can safely guide our choices as to how and where we build. But that's no longer true. We're going to have bigger, worse extremes in our future, and we need to account for those now as we build and as we make choices. And it's not just human-built structures that will collapse in the face of climate change. It's also our natural systems. So we need to figure out how we're going to cope in that very changed world. And as we make investments today, it's important that they're better, as has been referenced. Uh, there are a lot of different analyses, but at a minimum, it's somewhere above four degree, four dollars for each one dollar we spend in reducing risk before a disaster occurs. So there's a huge financial incentive to get this right. And planning helps you incorporate that into your future choices. One area where the United States is lagging is we do not have a national plan. That's one area where Congress could help with leadership or the Biden administration could also choose to put forward a national plan. China has one, France has one, the EU just issued one, Canada's working on one, and many developing nations also are working on them. So we're an outlier, but without a plan, it's very difficult to make sure that you're making those correct decisions in a whole of government and then really a whole of community approach so that both the private sector, state and local governments, tribal governments, as well as the federal government are all rowing in the same direction as we make these important decisions about how to better prepare for a very changed future. One of the other things that we could look at is our cost benefit analysis, both overseas and here in the United States to better incorporate the fact that we have a long time horizon when it comes to climate change. And we have historically discounted uh, investments for future protection in favor of lower cost because typically to be better protected, it's going to cost slightly more. But we know if we invested in that now, it would save us a lot of money in the long run. And that cost benefit analysis needs close attention. It seems like a wonky issue, but it's really an issue that will determine where dollars flow. And that's something that the federal government, the OMB's uh, current discount rate is, is 
perceived as hindering our ability to make better investments for our own safety here in the United States. And we, it's really important that we get this right now. We do not currently have a set of climate resilient building codes. Um, some nations are further along and certainly have called out the need to do that explicitly. As Leo has said, there have been a number of efforts done, but we don't really have an easy place for, for interested parties to go to, to figure out how do you build for greater storm surge, for hotter, more vicious fires, for higher wind speeds. It's difficult to do that. But the US puts up, uh, at least pre-pandemic, we put up about over half a million houses every year. We're doing a lot of building every year as we replace and retrofit. We need to figure out how do we make those investments also sound going forward. One of the things also that we've seen front and sever center as we've all experienced this COVID-19 catastrophic event, it's given us a chance to each see how catastrophic risk unfolds. And I remember a friend at FEMA telling me, you know, we just never imagined that we would have to respond to all 50 states plus the territories at once during a pandemic, plus have all these other events that happened last year. So we need to seriously think about emergency management and it's wonderful to hear about the different efforts underway. Certainly there is a lot of opportunity to cooperate internationally because we know that the demands, for example, on the military will increase for the need for humanitarian missions. Uh, when Typhoon Haiyan hit the Philippines several years ago, the US government was the first to respond. And we are known for our willingness to help out and lend a hand, helping hand. But we're going to have a lot more of these emission, missions going forward and we need to plan for those. Similarly, historically, we've cooperated with Australia. We've sent firefighters to Australia during their fire season and they've sent firefighters to us during their fire season. But the seasons are now extending almost year round. In fact, right now, California uh, is definitely in drought. Its uh, snowpack has been uh, melting and it may face a much earlier fire season now. So we have to figure out how we will coordinate better in the future to have the surge capacities that we need to respond to these acute events. An additional area for us to all be thinking about is the fact that climate change ignores all borders. It's like a pandemic. Humans have carefully crafted jurisdictional borders that determine decision making across the globe. In the United States, we have some 89,000 different governmental entities making decisions. But the climate impacts, just like COVID-19, just sweep across those borders. And we need to come up with a serious plans, serious plans on how we're going to plan regionally, both within the United States and across borders, and that would include in our overseas development work to be better able to withstand. One of the acute places this will occur quickly is in our river basins, uh, because as we experience frequently too little water in areas that have had long-standing agreements how to share that water. Those agreements don't yet reflect the change conditions brought by climate change. And if they don't, there will be folks downstream who may be hurt as the upstream uh, entities and, and governments use that water to take care of their own populations. But there's left, less left at the end of the day for the downstream, uh, downstream neighbors. And of course, uh, COVID-19 has taught us a lot about vulnerability and how these impacts, as has been stated so eloquently, fall very unevenly. And we've learned a lot about gender, how the women, uh, both in the United States, as well as overseas, often pay a higher price, as do the children. Uh, we know that uh, we've seen more, we will see more stunting as a result of climate change. That's when kids simply don't get enough nutrition, 
So uh, they don't reach their full height, they don't reach their full mental capabilities, which can have a long term impact on the health of the nation and the economy uh, if there is stunting within the population. So we need to tend to how are we going to make sure that we have helped those who most need help prepare for these events. And that takes some careful planning to get there. Finally, I want to talk about uh, one issue and Leo touched upon this and this is incredibly important. In my experience in the world of climate change, the adaptation community and the mitigation community have been fairly separate. Indeed, some in the mitigation community did not look on with on favorably adaptation effort because they viewed it as an admittance of failure on the mitigation side. Uh, it's uh, similar to what we may be experiencing when we start talking about geoengineering. Uh, there's a, a concern that that also signals that we failed. But the fact is, we need to adapt now. As Andrew said, we've baked in impacts for the future. That's just the delayed way the atmosphere works. So we are going to have further heating, which brings these events, flooding, droughts, extreme heat, sea level rise in the foreseeable future, even if we're incredibly successful at cutting our emissions. We have a lot ahead of us that we need to prepare for. So the last thing I'll say is that as we think as a nation, as Congress, as we work with countries overseas, what we need to be thinking about and move beyond the thinking that I think where I was for much of the Obama administration we need to go beyond. In the Obama administration, we focused a lot on how can we make particular infrastructure assets, a dam, a bridge, a road, climate resilient. And that Biden administration has echoed that in its infrastructure plan. But that's not all of it. We have to think about how do we gain resilience through these investments, meaning that we actually end up with a community with people more resilient. Making an asset sturdier may not get us there. And we have to understand that that requires us to look at land use issues and other issues to really determine whether at the end of the day, we will be more resilient as a result of that res investment. And that is an important change in our thinking that we have to get to. How do we achieve resilience through these investments rather than simply making sure that the investments, that hard structure itself is resilient? Because at the end of the day, it may not be resilient to the kinds of impacts we will see. Could be that the seas rise too much and we need to make choices that are different in the face of those risks. So I want to applaud uh, this session, uh, everyone's interest in these matters, and particularly the Biden administration for putting this front and center, the need to do both, that we have to improve, and for their expressed ambition in trying to make sure that we have a safer outcome for all of us, including in the United States. So I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it was our pleasure, Alice. Thank you so much. Um, I like the framing of the beyond. Um, if you missed it for this, is for our audience, if you missed any of Alice's presentation, if you'd also like to go back and revisit what Andrew said, what Leo said, I just wanted to mention a quick reminder that all of this will be archived online at www.esi.org. We'll also provide written notes as well, or summary notes. Um, and there's still time to ask questions. Um, we will do that after our final speaker who will join us in just a moment. If you have a question, follow us on Twitter at ESI online. You can send us an email, EESI at EESI.org. And now it is my privilege to introduce Rachel Jacobson. Rachel is Deputy Director of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Rachel leads the development, implementation, and continuous improvement of ASAP's program. She connects adaptation people and ideas by overseeing the ASAP Connects program, advances effective adaptation practice, through the Adaptation Careers Program, supports adaptation leadership development, 
and field-wide capacity building through the ASAP SERVES program. Internally, Rachel also leads ASAP's monitoring and evaluation efforts and ensures that new activities align with member values and ASAP priorities. Um, should also just very briefly mention when I talked about the resilience report the ESI issued last week, um, Rachel was a part of that effort, uh, as well as Beth Gibbons at ASAP. Just wanted to quickly plug that once more and to say thank you for all your help making that report a reality. Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Take it away. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, thank you to EESI and to the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to share my screen because um, I'm a visual learner and I'm sure that there are others out there as well who are. So we can have the benefit of a few visuals as I speak. All right, so as Deputy Director of American Society of Adaptation Professionals, I'm really witnessing every day the successes and the needs of climate change adaptation and climate resilience practitioners, workers, and scholars. Um, so adaptation professionals are doing everything from developing community climate adaptation plans to making changes to corporation supply chains, um, choosing new crops to plant, to investing in resilient buildings. Um, we're working at every scale and in every sector to help communities, ecosystems, and economies adapt to climate change and build resilience to climate impacts. Um, and you can see here um, just the map and a sectoral breakdown of the ASAP membership. Um, as adaptation professionals, uh, we're keeping the needs and desires of individuals and communities who are on the front lines of climate change first, always. And so I think it's really important for you all to see and hear what that means to us. And our, my fellow panelists have alluded to this um, in their remarks as well. People and communities on the front lines of climate change are those that are experiencing the consequences of climate change first and worse. Um, and they include people who are both highly exposed to climate risks because of the places they live and have fewer resources, capacity, safety nets, or political power to respond to those risks because of widespread discrimination. Um, and they include Black people, Indigenous peoples, people of color, people with low incomes, um, as well as many other individuals and communities, such as immigrants, people at risk of displacement, people with disabilities. Um, and at ASAP, it is our responsibility to ensure that our members have the enabling environment to do their work well. Um, and while the breadth of work that's required to adapt to climate change is vast, I think that there are three themes that really summarize the changes that need to happen in the federal policy space to create this enabling environment for adaptation work. And those three themes are funding to implement known actions and strategies, reforms of existing policies to avoid maladaptation, and then transforming, looking ahead to envision problems and solutions that we haven't yet experienced and rising to the challenge to meet them. Um, and in order to address the needs that fall with, within each of these themes, we really need strong leadership on adaptation and resilience at the highest levels to lead to a unified adaptation and resilience strategy across the federal government and better coordination and alignment among all federal agencies to tackle adaptation and resilience. Um, and Leo outlined some of the ways that the Biden administration is making progress on this front, um, but as I will outline, <laughs> outline for you all in just a second, um, I think there's a lot more that we need to do. So in the next few minutes, I'm gonna share some examples and principles related to each of these three themes, focusing on the work that we need to do here at home in the US. And I really appreciated, Alice, what you said about the U.S. not being exceptional when it comes to the way that we experience climate impacts. Um, so I hope that this will paint a picture of the type of changes that we need across the board to meet the challenge of adaptation and resilience, both domestically and internationally as well. So first, let's talk about funding. So I'm sure it is no uh, surprise that the most cited need of adaptation professionals is more funding to implement this work on the ground. Um, and there are a lot of strategies and a growing body of technical assistance to help communities use public, private, and blended finance to obtain capital for local adaptation plans and projects. At the end of the day, though, it will simply be impossible to implement the scale of work that needs to happen on the ground without significantly more federal dollars allocated 
to directly to adaptation work through mechanisms such as grants and revolving loan funds. Um, and of course, we don't just need more money for this work. We also need better principles for how it's allocated and spent. Um, and the three things that I want to highlight are that people and communities impacted by climate change and by the actions that we take to adapt to climate change must be in control of how this money is spent. Um, agencies have to remove burdensome prerequisites and applications, um, not remove applications entirely, but remove, remove um, burdensome elements of applications so that federal funding doesn't only accrue to the communities that have the resources to apply for it and access it. Um, and the funding must be able to be flexibly applied to community determined priorities, um, such as in the case of HUD's community development block grants. Um, I just want to speak briefly about another way to get more money into the hands of communities um, by harnessing a model pioneered by the state of Massachusetts that we're now seeing in North Carolina as well. These states have used executive action to create programs that provide technical assistance and funding for climate resilience planning and imp implementation in cohorts of local communities across the state. Um, and with more federal funding to pass through the state programs such as these, as well as, of course, incentives for more states to enact them, um, a greater number of communities and all different types of communities would have both the foundation for sound climate adaptation, i.e. local vulnerability assessments and climate adaptation resilience plans, as well as resources to implement projects that, of course, reduce those vulnerabilities and protect the assets that are identified by those communities and those plans. Um, so the second theme I want to touch on is the need to reform existing policies to avoid maladaptation, um, which um, the IPCC defines as actions that may lead to increased risk of adverse climate-related outcomes, increased vulnerability to climate change, or diminished welfare now or in the future. Um, things like failing to anticipate expected climate change <laughs> or trading long-term vulnerability for short-term benefits. Now, there are a lot of existing laws and policies that can and should be leveraged to meet adaptation and resilience needs. And this is where the Biden administration has really put most of its focus thus far is leveraging those. Um, things like our existing federal environmental laws, um, incentives for conservation, um, and our robust climate monitoring research and assessment programs. These are all crucial tools, existing tools for incentivizing and enabling adaptation and resilience. But there are many existing laws and policies that promote maladaptation. Um, and they do this by, for example, not incorporating forward-looking climate information or by inequitably allocating risks and benefits. Um, so for example, engineers and planners throughout the US use NOAA's Atlas 14 statistical data for infrastructure design, but Atlas 14 doesn't have rainfall data that integrates future climate projections. So you have the lifespan of a bridge of 50 to 75 years. Um, design requirements using Atlas 14 have to be able to take into account both today's rainfall and anticipated future rainfall. Um, and then, you know, Alice talked about uh, cost benefit analyses. We have to consider where risks and benefits are accruing due to federal policies. And for federal programs that use benefit cost analysis that's tied, for example, to property values, that means that adaptation, and adaptation projects in places with lower property values get passed over or devalued when often those are the places that need those projects the most. And finally, we have to acknowledge that climate impacts are transitioning us to a new reality, one without precedent. And my fellow pa panelists illustrated this well. Um, and so we, if we merely use existing federal programs to protect existing assets against the dangers of the past, that will obviously not be enough. Um, we need a distinct set of policies designed explicitly to address current and future climate impacts. So let's take, for example, individuals and communities contemplating or experiencing the need to move to a new place to sustain their lives or livelihoods as they experience climate impacts. This will be the reality for millions of people in the US displaced by sea level rise, for example, not to mention hundreds of millions more across the globe. Um, and it's already the reality for communities like New Talk, Alaska, which has been waiting over 30 years to relocate, and individuals like 
Olga McKissick in Louisville, Kentucky, who waited over 10 years for a buyout of her home that had been repeatedly flooded. Adaptation professionals are working tirelessly to help communities design and navigate local buyout processes, develop community relocation plans, implement local regulations to discourage building in hazardous areas, and to try to understand when, from where, and importantly, to where people will move as climate impacts worsen. What we need is a federal strategy and guidance that provides national level objectives to envision and enact climate migration and manage retreat as just, equitable, effective climate adaptation strategies. And we need coordinated technical assistance and dedicated funding that's accessible to all the people and places that need to use manage retreat and climate migration as adaptation strategies. And we need to understand that the places people move to and the question of whether there will be housing, jobs, and communities in those places is just as important of a question as where and when people will move from climate impact to places. So we've covered three themes that are important to consider for federal adaptation and resilience policy here in the US. Funding the strategies and actions we know we need, reforming existing policies to avoid maladaptation, and envisioning this new reality and the needed policies to address and embrace it. Um, and I really hope that this has painted a picture of the type of changes we need across the board to meet the challenge of adaptation and resilience, um, certainly domestically, but internationally as well. So finally, I just wanna close with some thoughts on how to prioritize what to do first. Um, of course, climate action is needed now um, in the midst of economic recovery, a racial justice reckoning, an ongoing health disaster. Um, and so here at American Society of Adaptation Professionals, our 2021 policy priorities um, are designed to illustrate how adaptation professionals are thinking about what to focus on this year. Um, and they are to create federal standards for climate data and mandate use of future climate projections in agency decisions, uh, treat climate change as a crisis and prioritize justice and equity in that crisis response, um, overlay climate resilience needs and all infrastructure decisions, preserve and manage natural systems for climate resilience. And then really importantly, um, and I really appreciate uh, Leo for uh, focusing on this in part of his remarks, define, develop, and train the climate change adaptation and climate resilience workforce. Um, and that includes investing in and increasing the consistency of education and training for climate change adaptation and climate resilience professionals and workers. Um, and these priorities, which were created by and for ASAP members, don't just signal what we'll advocate for in 2021. They also represent where ASAP members have deep expertise. Um, and there's obviously a whole lot of work to be done. Um, and our members are ready to partner with decision makers at all skills of governance to provide adaptation insight and ultimately to raise the ambition and most importantly, the impact of our collective work. Um, so thank you very much. Look forward to the questions. Thank you, Rachel. And um, thanks for that excellent presentation. Thanks also to Andrew, Leo, and Alice for their presentations as well. We have a lot to cover and about 20-ish minutes or so to cover it in the Q&A. Um, so I will invite um, the panelists to um, turn their audio and video on, or at least video. I guess we can mute and unmute as we go. Um, we have a few uh, topics I want to get to, and also um, we're having some questions come in from the audience as well. So thank you for sending those in. Um, Andrew, I would like to um, turn to you first, and then we'll go through the order of the presentations. Um, all of you touched on one way or the other issues around equity and justice and how we advance climate adaptation and resilience. I would like to use um, the first part of our Q&A to expound a little bit on that, to explore how that can be done, if there are examples, um, whether it's in the United States or in the United Kingdom or from elsewhere, if there are approaches that you think could provide sort of the maximum benefits in the near term when it comes to um, equity and justice as we um, make our communities uh, more, adapt more adaptable and more resilient. Andrew? Um, thank you. I, I think um, 
the the points I made in the work, and I'll focus on the international, um, is that everything that we're doing is about building inclusive approaches. So prioritizing and driving the action that for those who are most vulnerable to climate change, um, as mentioned in the presentations, might be women, girls, young people, um, indigenous people, disabled, all, all groups who can be um, marginalized or exposed. So the, th this is why one element um, of our approach has been um, endorsing the principles for locally led adaptation um, and you know, encouraging others uh, to do the same. So we, we think that that, um, that that is certainly a part of it. Um, and perhaps another example is the, um, particularly working with some of the least developed countries, those countries to be owning the initiatives that we're promoting. And, th and that was a distinctive feature of the, the Life AR, um, the Least Developed Countries Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience that I mentioned. So just very briefly, I think those, those two, the, the inclusion um, and particularly when it comes to developing countries, the developed country led uh, model. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Leo, how can we ensure that we're advancing adaptation and resilience in an equitable and just way from your perspective? Uh, just a couple of ideas that um, we included, Alice and I included in our book uh, on this is a chapter specifically on the issue of equity uh, and inequality in the face of climate change. Um, just a, a couple of thoughts here. One is we should not forget the importance of strengthening the existing social safety nets. Uh, as we argue in the book, uh, it's clear that when uh, climate disasters strike, um, one of the most essential uh, first uh, lines of defense uh, is your traditional social safety nets, your ability uh, to rely on those for continued employment uh, in, in the aftermath of such a disaster, uh, the ability to move, relocate uh, was essential, for example, in the aftermath of Katrina, um, thanks to a number of uh, safety nets that allowed people uh, the, the resources necessary uh, to uh, to relocate in the immediate aftermath was was really important, uh, and so an investment in our social safety nets broadly uh, will also help uh, our resilience uh, in specific localities. So that's uh, really crucial. The second thing has to do with um, the relationship between business and government. Uh, I think there's a lot of corporations now around the world that are, are getting very smart about resilience and adaptation. Uh, they're investing heavily in uh, climate. Uh, resilient facilities and climate resilient factories and climate resilient transportation networks. The problem is that if the public infrastructure around you fails, if your workers can't get to work, if your suppliers can't deliver you the goods, if you can't get your products out to market because uh, public infrastructure has failed around you, it doesn't matter how much you invest in your own private uh, infrastructure. And so what we need is a um, set of efforts between local governments and the businesses in which uh, they are embedded, uh, the businesses that are embedded in that community uh, to figure out how to work together to ensure that they have mutual resilience to climate, not just um, kind of private resilience, which ultimately depends on public. Uh, and finally, uh, the distribution of adaptation resources is really crucial. Uh, I remember, we remember talking to uh, uh, planner in New York City who said, look, if you wanted me to deploy adaptation resources focused exclusively on reducing losses, financial losses, I would put all my money in Southern Manhattan because that's where the assets are. That's where the wealth is. But if you did that, of course, it would have terrible impacts on uh, equity. And so what we need is a different approach. It, it can't just be about uh, avoiding the losses, the economic losses. It has to be uh, about ensuring that uh, you're protecting a broader uh, set of people. And that means changing the lens we use when making these financial decisions. It means having different voices at the table when these allocations are made. Thank you. Uh, Alice, um, I'd love to hear a little more from you on sort of what's working and what perhaps we could double down on to advance equity and justice in these efforts. Sure, I think that uh, many important uh, topics have been uh, spoken to, but I think to hone in on disasters and how they impact communities, 
uh, across the world and including in the United States, we need to improve early warning. Uh, and it needs to be based on forecasting. The further out we can get that forecasting, the Biden administration has indicated they want to move that. So it's longer term forecasting, allows people to prepare in advance before disaster strikes. If you couple that early warning, more robust early warning systems with some kind of parametric or disaster insurance or social stronger social net, you'll have a lot better outcomes. Uh, and one of the growing tools used in development, often with donor dollars, so people have to give the money for this to happen, is parametric insurance. And that is insurance that uh, has a trigger. So for example, if there's a storm warning, it's based on a forecast, we get the forecast strong. If there's a storm warning, the community is given an infusion of cash through their phones, through other ways in the developing world, that means that the goat doesn't have to be sold. The girl isn't pulled out of school. The children aren't pulled out of school. And steps can be taken to protect the home, the livelihood, and really ensure that there's a better outcome. So we've already seen many of these programs develop across the globe. Uh, and similarly in the United States, we have uh, many, many Americans who don't have even $400 to evacuate. They don't have the cash available. So as we improve our early warning systems, we need to figure out ways to help people get out of harm's way. It's a very first and basic step, but many of our most vulnerable populations are at the greatest risk. Uh, if you look at the recent information about redlining, uh, we put uh, people of color, blacks in areas that were more flood prone and many of those communities are still in those areas. So we need to give them better help in advance as we have longer term plans about how we'll address these threats. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, um, from your perspective, um, any things that our audience should know um, in terms of approaches? Yeah, well, one thing that I want to highlight first and foremost is um, the U.S. recently released a strategic planning framework for action for community empowerment. Um, and so that is leveraging existing education, communication, workforce development, civic infrastructure to mobilize all of society um, for just community-driven climate action. Um, this is such a great example of using bottom-up grassroots approaches, even in the context of a national strategic planning framework that was developed, of course, in, in the context of an international framework. Um, and so I think that ACE, our US strategic plan for ACE, is such a great example of where to look for some principles and best practices. Um, and then I just wanna give three more examples here. I, first and foremost, I wanna acknowledge the people who are doing this work on the ground, particularly through community-based organizations that are rooted in environmental justice principles and the environmental justice movement, because it's really important to note that work that's happening under the banner of environmental justice is often adaptation and resilience work, but it's not always labeled as such. Um, so as we're thinking about what is a holistic national strategy for increasing our ambition for just and equitable adaptation and resilience, we should be looking at the people who've been doing that work on the ground for decades um, under the banner of environmental justice, because that's where the best practices are, and that's also where the implementation is. Um, two more quick examples, um, the State of California Partners Advancing Climate Equity Program, um, cohort of local leaders doing capacity building, um, and then um, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science really has been such the standard bearer of so many things in adaptation resilience, especially as it relates to ecosystem adaptation, um, but I want to particularly highlight their work with tribes um, with indigenous peoples and incorporating traditional eco ecological knowledge into climate planning frameworks um, is, has been truly exceptional. Um, so the tribal climate adaptation menu um, is a great um, example that brings together all that work. Thanks for that very much. Um, I'd like to go through the panel once again and ask, um, sort of give everyone an opportunity to comment. Um, it's been referenced a few times. This is the week of the leaders climate or summit on climate. Um, and one of the goals, I think we've all said of, of this briefing is to raise awareness of adaptation and resilience sort of this week, but I'd like us to look beyond and 
um, hear everyone's thoughts about how we collectively increase the profile of adaptation and resilience um, as we move forward, as on the road to COP26 between now and when that event takes place. Andrew, happy to turn it to you first for your comment and then we'll, we'll go through the line again. Um, thank you. Um, I'll be brief on this. Um, and, and I think in terms of the, the direct lead up to you will continue to hear from the, the UK. Um, as was mentioned, is the adaptation of resilience is a big priority and our G7 presidency, as well as the COP26, will be using the different multilateral platforms uh, to promote this uh, agenda. Um, very specifically encouraging more countries to join the Adaptation Action Coalition, more businesses and other institutions um, to support the, the race to resilience. Um, uh, and then I think more generally, there are so many very powerful examples that we've heard some in the US today, um, but right around the world of countries who are um, implementing new uh, approaches to adaptation and resilience, application of new technologies. It actually makes it quite an exciting space to be working in. And I think the more that we can be telling that story um, and, um, and engaging people in it, uh, the better to really, really raise this awareness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leo? I think coming from the summit, the key is to ensure that it's not a point in time, uh, that it's not just uh, a one-off, but rather a destination on the journey to something bigger. And so we're hoping the, uh, the summit will raise the, elevate the, uh, the importance of these issues. We'll hopefully encourage uh, governments, including of course our own, to make some important announcements and commitments uh, but then to use uh, the Petersburg Dialogue coming up soon, the G7, um, Glasgow itself, uh, and, uh, and then of course next year, uh, to begin to solidify some of that consensus and to put into place uh, a new burst of energy uh, into this agenda. And I think that's uh, ultimately what we would like to do with this, uh, with this approach. Thank you. Alice? Well, because I tend to think in terms of what the federal government can do. Um, I think the Biden administration could, first of all, uh, has been, as I've said, create a plan, create a strategy. And that would drive better decision-making across the federal government in terms of incorporating climate risk. That is solely within the power of the Biden administration to do that. In anticipation of that, I would recommend that they set out to educate their workforce. I think Rachel has uh, put her finger on a very difficult problem. Most decision makers across the federal government don't have any formal training in climate change. They don't understand what's going to happen. And that's not just the federal government, that's across the board. So we need to make sure that those who are drafting the plans that Biden has already called for, much less an expanded plan and strategy, have the necessary knowledge. And we've got to make sure that we have a level playing field because right now you could have someone who's very sophisticated and then someone who's questioning, which I've seen, why do I even need to care about this now? We need to answer those questions before we can really get to the kind of level of understanding and drive to make sure that we have adaptation, both planning for internationally as well as domestically. And Rachel? Well, of course, couldn't have asked for a better segue. And of course, we have Alice as one of our esteemed ASAP members. Um, and that's what we do here. You know, we um, build the capacity of adaptation professionals. And adaptation professionals are the people integrating um, considerations of future climate information into their day-to-day -day work, and that can and should be everyone across the federal government. Um, I think really what we need, in, as not as a result of, but I mean, you know, in conjunction with this summit, we need an integrated conversation about mitigation and adaptation. And I think that all of the panelists here have made that point in one way or another. So let me just end with that. I mean, we have time running out before irreversible feedback loops set in. It'll take all of our collective efforts, not to just avoid dangerous overshoot through mitigation, but adapt to the impacts that are locked in and adapt to the unknown scale of impacts that will result from whatever trajectory our mitigation efforts put us on. That's the message. And until we have that message blaring loud and clear from the administration and everywhere else, then we will have missed the mark. Um, but I think we can do it. And I'll just close with a really brief personal story when the election happened in 2020, it was this weird time for me where all of a sudden I needed to start checking the news 
for climate stories. That had not been the case for four years. So I started checking the news for climate stories and then I stopped checking the news because no climate stories were about adaptation and resilience. So when we talk about raising the ambition, I'm just from my little corner of the world, I wanna be checking the news and seeing that integrated conversation represented in those climate stories. And as I just said, I, I really think we can get there and I'm, I'm excited about that. Well, that, uh, Rachel, thank you for that. And it's a great sentiment and I'm afraid we may have to end on it, or I'm not afraid we'll have to end on it. I'm afraid we'll have to end. And that is a good place to end. That's probably a nicer way to put that. Um, I, we are at 1230, which is the end of our panel. Um, and so I would just like to say thank you once again to Andrew, to Leo, to Alice, and to Rachel for your remarkably, um, speaking of integration, how much perfectly could you integrate four presentations um, across two different continents? Um, thank you so much for bringing your expertise and perspectives to our audience today. Um, I would like to uh, end with a few sort of logistical and housekeeping items. But before I do that, um, before I, I wouldn't want anyone to drop off the live stream before I once again thank um, our sponsors, the 2021 UN Climate Change Conference, the British Embassy Washington, American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Thank you for helping us bring this information to our audience today as well. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, also want to take a quick moment to acknowledge my new friend, Amy Spall, for helping us pull all of this together. Um, I think I might even go so far as to say this was Amy's idea. And so thank you, Amy, very, very much. Um, this couldn't have been a better way for EESI to kick off this week. Um, and um, this is um, uh, an incredibly interesting, but also an incredibly important topic. So thank you very much for that. Um, I would also like to thank everyone um, on Team EESI for all of their contributions uh, for pulling this off. I'd like to thank Dan O'Brien, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Todoroff, Anna McGinn, Omri Laporte, and a special shout out to our five fabulous interns, Celine, Hamza, Jocelyn, Kimmy, and Rachel for all of their work, live streaming, collecting questions, all of that. Thank you so much. This slide is a survey link. Um, we would really appreciate if you have a moment or two to fill out our survey. It helps us um, reorient our programming to make sure that we're responsive to the needs of policymakers and others in our audience. We read every bit of feedback you provide. And so if you, if you fill out the survey, if you take the two minutes, you can be assured that um, we will take a look at it for sure and do our best to incorporate your suggestions for improvement. Thank you very much in advance for doing that. Um, this is the beginning of a busy week. It's a big, uh, we've had a, a very busy first few months of the hundred and of the new Congress and the new administration. Um, I would like to plug two upcoming briefings. One is tomorrow at noon, Rethinking, Reduce, Reuse, and Recycle, Policies and Programs to Address Waste. That is going to be a really interesting session. Uh, I hope if you haven't already had an opportunity to RSVP, you can do that by visiting us online at www.eesi.org. Um, and next Friday is the fourth installment of Congressional Climate Camp. Um, during Alice's presentation, she mentioned building codes. We love building codes too. And actually we will be featuring building energy codes in particular during that climate camp session, which is all about mitigation and adaptation win-wins, or as I like to call them, double whammies. Things we can do in the near term that advance uh, climate mitigation and at the same time, advance climate adaptation. So very, very much um, along the lines of what we've heard from our panelists today about what policymakers need to be paying attention to. Um, that is next Friday, April 30th at 2 p.m. and all of our times are listed in Eastern. Um, thank you so much once again for joining us today. I hope everyone has a great Earth Day and a great rest of your Monday. Um, we will go ahead and end it there. Um, thank you again to Andrew, Leo, Alice, and Rachel. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>